Let's look again at uh, the media itself. So, uh, actually, Mar Marshall McLuhan in the 60s uh, wrote, wrote the book Understanding Media, which uh, was kind of a very, very pioneering book, which people didn't really understand the, the, um, uh, the actual effect on our society. But he could predict almost everything that's happened uh, in, in the 60s, so, um, so more than 40 years ago. And, He's def he's def one of his def definitions uh, saying that, you know, he's saying in the 60s we live in a speed of electric involvement that creates an integral whole of both private and public awareness. We live today in the age of information and of communication because electric media instantly and constantly creates a total field of interacting events which all men participate. Of course, he meant women too. But the, the most important thing is he could understand that we are reaching a new point of society. We have instant and global connectivity, and it's going to rad radically change our society. And basically, what he predicted has come true or is coming true. So, um, media, uh, so Marshall McLuhan could realize media is much more than just uh, the traditional sense of telecommunication. Uh, traditional media such as newspaper and books and computing. He really saw it as, as our extension of senses into the world. And so we can look at natural and humanistic ways of interfacing with both people remotely as well as locally and with machines and new, this will bring out new ways of communication between people, between cultures and races between humans and machines, and even between machines and machines. So, if we have a look at our, our uh, basic interaction, this is mo how most people use digital media now. So, it's, it's behind a screen. So, the, your brain is forced to bridge the gap between reality and the virtual reality, computer world. And of course, in the 80s, there was a big promise of virtual reality. There was too much hype, uh, and that's why the field it didn't really reach its potential. But one of the big problems is when you create virtual reality, uh, you have very little connection with the real world. And there's been a lot of research to show that people uh, do not find that very useful for either work or play. So now these are kind of the new paradigms that uh, we're looking at in the field of um, computing and media. So to, instead, of, instead of put the human inside virtual reality, to bring the digital world and virtual reality into our physical space, which can mean ubiquitous computing, where the whole physical space is embedded with intelligent computing machines, or augmented interaction, where we filter the uh, real world with uh, virtual reality. And you can see the kind of uh, uh, viewpoint that we had in, that we uh, changed our viewpoint of what is uh, media and what is uh, computing. So, 
Uh, this um, this movie here. Has anyone anyone seen this movie? 2001 Space Odyssey. It's a classic. Uh, so you can see in 68 when they made this movie, this was imagined. This, this is what they imagined would be the future of communication. So there's a there's a man there. He's sitting in front of the screen and there's a kind of camera and he's speaking to his uh, family on the planet Earth. And actually, this ha already happened more than 10 years ago. We already invented such invented that future. Um, but the problem is, we realise that this kind of uh, in interaction behind screens has uh, some disadvantage. There's a separation from a real world and virtual world, and 2D collaboration is not ideal because we are more attuned to interacting in 3D space. So 10 years later, this is this is the kind of uh, uh, this is the kind of concept that people are thinking. How would we interact with computers and media? And this is the, the, the original and the, I think the best Star Wars movie. Um, and you can see, in this case here, people, there's no screen. So people are imagining that uh, we, we have 3D communication and the virtual world becomes an integral part of the physical space. So for example, if you're working together to be able to point and gesture and touch objects as if they're real is an important tool for collaborative work and collaborative play. Um, then, jump again uh, another, another decade or so, and uh, uh, Professor Hiroshi Ishii in the MIT Media Lab uh, was one of the pioneers to uh, uh, coming up with the concept of tangible interfaces and showing that we should uh, not only bring virtual world into physical space, but we should interact with it in a physical manner, tangible interaction. And he developed various um, pioneering systems, which, which, for example, the TerraVision and Pinwheels, um, which I don't probably don't have time to go into detail now, but were, were, were works where it's showing that you could embed the, phys the physical uh, objects with computing uh, and virtual media. And studies of such tangible interfaces where the virtual world is expressed or can be directly manipulated through uh, uh, physical interaction uh, show that this has a lot of benefit. Uh, Donald Norman, who's a very famous designer, um, uh, showed that uh, physical objects make us smart. Uh, they, they, have, they act as information artifacts and actually assist Cognition. So being able to physically interact actually, um, in his words, make us smart. And objects uh, aid in collaboration. Object, physical objects uh, establish a shared meaning. And they also can increase understanding, serve as a cognitive artifact. So, then, and then also um, in the 80s, um, a, a, psycho a, a psychologist, Balki, did some very uh, good and uh, important work to show that uh, humans, uh, as social creatures, find physical interaction and touch essential for enjoyment of life. So, we, again, this is another viewpoint that we need to make systems which not only provide uh, uh, virtual media, but also the physical aspect. So now, um, uh, some of the uh, areas that, um, that that's, um, I'm interested in and we're looking into it in my lab with my students is how can we use such media to create new kinds of um, understanding and communication, not just pure, pure information, but to also ex explain subtle emotions and the intended mind. And a lot of this cannot be expressed through uh, logical or purely verbal communication. So how can we create new types of media that could embed all of our senses, in including, for example, clothing as media, taste and smell as interactive media. And um, this will allow new kinds of expression and culture. So um, basically, the, um, uh, some of the issues which are involved uh, include using mixed reality technology for um, network interaction, both in the physical and real world, creating new kinds of multimodal communication, which involve all of our senses, uh, all of our five senses. And also, how can we use uh, computing and media for bringing positive effect of light and social bonding and uh, human societies? This is kind of, 
the aim to, to, to design creative media. And so a lot of computer scientists are now very interested in this topic. So ACN, uh, one of so in computer science, probably the, uh, the most important society, has now is specifically has a lot of special issues and, and uh, journals on this topic. Um, I just want to quickly define uh, the concept of mixed reality, which actually was de uh, defined by Milgram. It's a relatively recent concept, I think about 97 was his paper. And he defined mixed, he de it was the first time the word mixed reality came into the uh, literature. He, he defined it as the spectrum between real environment, which we live in, and virtual environment, uh, which we also are very familiar with. But augmented reality is where we take the virtual world and embed it into the physical world. And augmented virtual reality is the opposite, where we uh, real time capture uh, the real world and embed it into the uh, physical space. So I want to show some examples of this. So uh, in this case here, this is a system which can do real time augmented uh, virtuality. It's a little bit old, uh, I did this five, five years ago, but it's just showing that uh, uh, at least at the research level, a lot of these problems uh, are getting solved or being solved. Of course, making real uh, real product is a different story. But you know, so we can in this case here, a system called 3D Live could uh, can capture uh, any object or humans in uh, real, real, almost real time, which means 30, 30 frames per second or more. And uh, with such a system you can have uh, remote, fully 3D communication with, with uh, uh, one or more, or more partners. So in this case here, is one of my students and she's uh, seeing a live uh, virtual avatar of another student in another location. And I'll show you a, a, a video of this now.
generate novel views of this kind at 30 frames per second. Furthermore, it's extremely robust and requires no special hardware. We can generate novel views from any angle. As you can see here, we can capture more than one actual actress at one time. As this sequence shows, we can also buffer the video stream to disk and introduce special effects such as freeze frame. The principal interest of our lab is in enhancing remote collaboration. Current video conferencing technologies cannot fully express non-verbal cues and remote communication suffers as a result. Hence, our main application is for video conferencing. I am here for the audition. Okay, what's your name? Uh, my name is Joe West. Okay, Joe, could you tell me something about your previous acting experience? I guess I was... Our system realistically introduces the content into the real world together with appropriate 3D sound, which solves many of these problems. Um, I was... What was I? I was the part of the donkey with the great role. We can also use the system to generate live 3D avatars for interactions in virtual spaces. We present the example of a guide to a virtual art gallery. Notice how the actor here can gesture to objects in the scene, the interaction that is extremely natural. Since we have generated a 3D model of the actor, realistic occlusion is also easy to implement. With our current camera configuration, the accuracy of the depth map is of the order of a few millimeters in the real world. You can imagine an architect walking his customers through his building and discussing the details with them. We also consider augmented reality interaction with a collaborator in a virtual environment. We can use the tangible card marker to pick the collaborator up and move him aside. We can change the virtual environment by turning over pages in a book. And then we can replace him. We have developed these tangible interaction techniques into a game. We use a marker to try to drop objects onto his head. The collaborator in the virtual environment attempts to jump out of the way in real time. You can see um, that uh, this 3D capture can allow the uh, kind of um, the interaction where the collaborator is seen as a, a, a real-time 3D object in your physical space, which allows new kind of interactions between the collaborators. And so you can see, at least on a, at a research level, we can now do real-time 3D communication. And of course, um, that um, since this, this work was done, there's been some improvements. For example, we don't need any more of the green background. We can use uh, just nat um, natural uh, background for the capture. Um, and also, we don't need those black markers anymore. We can track uh, what, with natural features, using natural feature tracking. But there's a lot of uh, maybe uh, boring technical computer science details, which um, at least for a conceptual level the, the object, the system is the um, so that was, a, that was a system where you could see what was augmented virtuality, where we could in real time take the uh, real world and put it into the virtual world and then you create interaction through the augmented virtuality space. And the, as I mentioned, the other way we can merge real world and, and virtual world is, is using augmented reality, where we can take the virtual world and make it part of our physical environment and then interact through the physical space but have the virtual objects embedded there as if they were part of the environment. Um, so this system here called Human Pac-Man was, um, was an attempt to make such uh, augmented reality interaction in a wide area physical space. So basically the idea is to um, embed the uh, natural physical world ubiquitously with, uh, in this case, a kind of um, a game, game concept. But of course it can be applied for uh, any, any type of scenario that could be imagined. But in this case here, uh, to show, to show um, uh, how can we make such uh, interaction, we, uh, so I, I decided to base it on a simple game of, of Pac-Man. And in this, but in this case here, the people, the, 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 the players are physically in, in the in the real world, and their bodies are connected in real time to the virtual game characters. So, 
uh, the basic concept is that the player has a uh, wearable computer, and uh, unfortunately, still we are stuck with these head mount displays. Uh, the next uh, big step for augmented reality will be when we can have uh, either very small displays, which is going to need a, a big leap in optics, um, or to create 3D uh, hologram. And so the basic idea is that as the person moves their body, their virtual character will move correspondingly in the virtual space, and then uh, he or she will see the real world in, embedded with uh, the augmented objects. So you can see here, uh, the person is, is playing as the kind of Pac-Man, and then as, as he walks through, walk, moves his body, he collects the, the cookie. OK, so this um, video will show uh, a demo which was first made for indoor, because the, the whole point is to make wide area and outdoor interaction. But just to show the, um, the system, you can see uh, the basic setup with the uh, indoor version. And uh, here's the uh, wearable computer, which is not very wearable. It's at three and a half kilos, but <laughs> this is uh, lab work. Um, then you can see the real maze corresponds with the virtual maze in real time. So this is that kind of an embodiment of physical space and virtual space. So as you can see, as, as, the, as the human player walks through, they can see the, the augmented cookies and collect them in, uh, just by moving their body. So the, 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 the real world becomes embedded with such virtual objects. And there's also other techniques, for example, using physical devices which have embedded sensing to uh, create interaction in the virtual space. The idea is that physical action directly corresponds to virtual world action. I'll show you a video which is uh, in the outdoor space. I'm sorry this is from TV, but they filmed it very good, very well. And so you can see here's outdoor version, which actually uses much more sophisticated tracking. Um, and we have to do a lot of uh, sensor fusion. But you can see even for wide area outdoor space, we can create quite smooth uh, augmented reality. So the op virtual objects uh, appear to be in, in, in the physical space. Um, so I, I began to think that the potential for this also might be not only for human-to-human -human interaction, but if you can use such systems uh, if, uh, to create even in new types of interspecies communication. Um, so this system here is taking that concept which I just said about augmented reality and uh, interactive gaming with humans, but could we, could we make also new uh, interactions, for example, with animals or, or pets? This system here is called Metazoa Ludens. And the idea is, can we create new interactive system for human and pets? And also, I'm interested in this kind of concept of the virtual world can become a kind of equalizer. So uh, this is a kind of game of cat and mouse, except now the human becomes the mouse. And I think virtual reality allows new, new kinds of interaction which is not possible in the physical world. So in this case here, the hamster uh, in the real world chases a, a, a bait. Actually, it's not food bait. It's a, it's a tunnel on a robotic arm. Robotic arm. Uh, and this corresponds to kind of a, uh, a giant avatar of the hamster chasing the human. And this loop between real world and virtual world allows a, a new form of communication between humans and animals. So I'll show the uh, video of the system here. Um, here is the virtual, virtual 3D game environment in the virtual world. This avatar corresponds to the human, and this is at corresponding in real time to the hamster. And the aim of the uh, game is for humans to run away from the hamster. But uh, we have an infrared track, tracking system to um, uh, track the, the hamster, and we have a robotic system which not only controls the uh, the robotic arm representing the human avatar, but also controls the terrain, because the hamster actually experiences the same terrain as in the virtual environment. But we make it very slow changing, otherwise it would be too difficult for the hamster. 
So you can see this virtual terrain, uh, sorry, the virtual terrain will correspond to the real terrain. So this is kind of like a window into the virtual space. And in real time, we track the hamster movement, and this corresponds to the pet avatar. And actually, we, uh, uh, we had, in, in our university, we have, of course, we have the Department of uh, Biological Sciences, we had two graduate students who did some uh, so-called user studies and to show that uh, the hamster would freely enter the system um, on average um, uh, higher than at this, when the system began. So they would show some preference for entering the system freely. Of course, this is not really a communication, it's kind of a one-way communication, so I'm still Trying, I'm still very troubled about this. How can, how can this be extended to real bi-directional communication? But that is kind of future research which I, I want to try to, to do. Um, so I'm just checking the time. Um, so as I mentioned, um, Basically, from an engineering viewpoint, we've solved a lot of the problems of information transmission. So we can almost perfectly transmit, uh, of course, text is, is almost perfect, and also audio. In fact, we've gone beyond perfect. So, uh, as, as, as you might know, Sony uh, introduced Super Audio CD uh, a few years ago. But can, can I, has anyone ever listened to a Super Audio CD in this audience? And we're in Japan. We're, these gadgets are free. Okay, so no one, right? So you can see basically we've gone beyond the need of uh, perfect, or what, what humans would think is perfect transmission of information. Super Audio CD was a plot because basically uh, nobody needed 128 bit audio and, and, uh, and all the basically CD and MP3 was enough. Um, so now it's, but now people are realizing that. Um, Although we've solved a lot of the information problem, a lot of the communication gap is for non-logical and non-verbal communication. So going from a paradigm of sharing experience, uh, sorry, sharing information to sharing experience. And this is where we need to look at how can we not only communicate with audio and, and video and text, but also with our other senses. A big, big one we're looking at now is touch. So, again on the topic of animals, but maybe I'm an animal lover, but um, so the first system that I developed was um, how could we uh, communicate with our pet remotely? Because uh, you cannot call up your pet, you cannot call up and talk to your pet, at least not currently. So the only way really is to uh, communicate with touch. So this system here uh, was trying to look at uh, can we have human to pet communication remotely? And the, 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 the idea is that a human could be in a uh, work or a different location and allow the, the, the human to communicate by touch with, with the pet. And I'll show you the, the video here of the system. to high levels of stress and unhappiness. We are busy each day traveling to many places and are forced to spend more of our time away from home. This creates a separation between humans and pets. Pets spend more time away from their owners without interaction. Humans have always lived with animals as social companions. Pets have been integrated into our families and have even helped in work tasks such as hunting, transportation, and farming. In today's modern life, one of the few things that brings warmness to our hearts and homes are pets. Pets satisfy humans' need to nurture. Virtual pet devices such as Tamagotchi and Ivo aim to provide humans with intelligent social companions traditionally provided by pets. However, studies have shown that although there is a kind of psychological connection, 
This kind of interaction is not the same as real companionship that grows between human and real pet animals. There is a need to feel the presence of our pets and have real emotional interaction, no matter where we are, whether traveling or at work. We present Poultry Internet, a system for remote human-pet interaction. Poultry are one of the most poorly treated animals in modern society, being mainly used as a food source and living in terrible conditions. Studies have shown that poultry are capable of feeling pleasure. They also have a high level of cognition and feelings. Chickens benefit from touch-based interaction with their owners and lead happier lives. It has been shown that mittens that are deprived of human contact are likely to be more anxious and prone to poor egg laying. Well, in, in Southeast Asia, traditionally people have kept chickens as pets in their backyards. In the uh, traditional Asian villages, there always chickens around, children were playing with them. So I wanted to really recreate that kind of traditional Asian style of pet. In today's world, chickens still fill the role of animal companions, and our system keeps this possible. Poultry Internet is made up of two subsystems. At the office system, the user is able to feel the presence of the pet and interact with it through a pet doll interface. At the backyard system, the pet wears a special haptic jacket, which reproduces the touch from its owner via data received from the Internet. We have embedded a touch sensing and wireless receiver circuit inside the pet doll. The touch sensing circuit is built upon the technique of capacitive touch sensing, where the area of human touch distorts an electric field and therefore registers a touch. We specially designed a pet chat jack for the chicken with embedded vibrating actuators and wireless Bluetooth module. This jacket recreates a convincing human touch for the chicken. Design considerations were incorporated to ensure that the jacket does not restrict the movement of the chicken and is not a significant burden to its movement. The human user interacts with the chicken through a pet doll interface. The interaction is illustrated here with the LED lights on a happy jacket. The chicken feels the touch and engages the human user. The chicken's response is captured with the camera registration. The human users enjoy the system, but in order to determine how the chicken liked the system, we asked it. To do this, we conducted a red door blue door test based on the Duncan principle. We put the chicken in a common corridor where it is free to choose between entering the red door, blue door, or remain at its place. If the chicken enters the blue door, we will remotely touch it through the pet doll interface. On the other hand, if the chicken goes into the red door, we would not do anything to it. The study allowed the chicken to interact and engage in the mediated touch interaction with the owner, or opt out of the experience and be left alone. Overwhelmingly, the chicken demonstrated a strong desire to interact with the system. The chicken enjoyed the experience. So, actually, um, uh, this system, uh, one of the reasons uh, I chose poultry is, of course, one I, I like poultry. I used to play with my grandfather's, grandfather's garden with poultry, but uh, when, when, I, when we started this uh, work, we uh, realised that um, uh, poultry actually has a very positive effect on touch, and even in some poultry farms, they have kind of, kind of artificial arm, which actually has some positive effects. So, but this system could not work, for example, for cat. I think for cat, but not generally not like to be touched, especially uh, for such a system. And the other thing is, uh, since uh, then this work, um, we're still uh, having to continue doing the the the, the, the studies we shown there because still we're not sure whether. Uh, the preference of the poultry was maybe the human will put on the jacket. Uh, maybe that was the pre the causing the preference. So, uh, so still, these results is not conclusive about whether it, it was preferring the jacket or preferred the human would, when when they entered the room, if the human would come into the room. Um, and also, uh, uh, we have to more carefully study, uh, make some study to eliminate that, that factor. Okay, so I think I'm a little bit out of time, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure all of these slides. But currently, uh, the, 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 the new work I'm doing on this is actually uh, now for using such touch interface for human-to-human -human communication. And uh, I think I've talked about this already, so I'll skip this slide. But basically, the, the, the idea is 
Uh, as I mentioned, we can already do a remote video and audio communication and text. But is it possible to have a kind of in, um, a, a media which can effectively reproduce the uh, the feeling of touch communication? Um, so in this case here, for some of the goals that we have to study, and still we don't have all the answers. Um, can we reproduce touch and, and, for example, hugging feeling remotely? How does it compare to real touch? And how does it enhance remote communication? Is, is this really something which would be a benefit for hum, humans? So um, we want to make some studies to look at um, parameters, uh, just to look at the issues which will be beneficial. And also, there's also a lot of, once you develop the system, there's also a lot of uh, issues in security, trust, privacy, ethics, which come about as well. Um, so, previous work has shown that, in general, touch is very important, uh, real touch, that is. Um, so, some, some previous relevant works. Um, uh, this work here, uh, by um, Bobinik, showed that with this rubber hands experiment, uh, showed that with the right context and right representation, uh, the human was convinced of a real hand, even though it was a uh, rubber hand, which uh, shows that it is possible we could create artificial system to give the feeling of a, a real human touch. And uh, probably, I think everyone here, the expert, knows about this work, but as you know, uh, there's, there's a work of uh, Harlow in um, Nature of Love, showed that when no physical context possible, artificial touch is better than, than none. So this means, for, we feel this means that, for example, if uh, uh, father or mother is, uh, for example, I'm in Kyoto now, my daughter is in Tokyo, there, there is no physical contact possible. So something would be better than nothing. Um, okay, so I probably I, should, I shouldn't go into details of this because <laughs> the, the, the audience here is expert in such matters. But uh, uh, this is showing why touch is important for human communication. <laughs> Um, now, also particularly uh, related to why hugging is important with parent and child relationships, because the first scenario that I like to consider is parent and child communication. Um, and then, so uh, uh, Spitz found that children younger than age two who are isolated from their mothers would lose interest in the environment and become unresponsive to an, in, uh, affection. And in the worst case, this could even lead to death. Very, very controversial. Of course, they did not do this test in the lab. It was based on, you know, orphanages. And, um, but the work is um, showing, at least shows there is de definite uh, benefit for, um, especially in young infants, for touch. And again, Balbi showed that children who suffer long-term or repeated separations during the first three years of life are usually uh, permanently, permanently disabled, mentally. Um, so, and then other various works which showed about the importance of uh, hugging and, and touch. Um, of course, infants communicate with touch, which is why I want to look at human uh, parent to child relations. And uh, some researchers argue that maternal touch can compensate for lack of verbal and facial emotional communication by depressed mothers with their infants. Okay, so. Uh, of course, we cannot solve all, all these problems, and this is just the very first step. But the idea is that can we make a system which can uh, add to add to the communication of, um, uh, of course, we can still have audio and video, but can we add that with touch as well? For especially with a very bad effect of modern society, where people are very constantly busy at work and uh, off, maybe off, do not have enough time with their children. Also, the children are so busy with school and cram school or something like this. Um, so here's the uh, system concept. We uh, have the father, father or mother, which will hug a doll, which will have sensor. And on the uh, other side, the uh, child will have um, the same um, sensation on his or her body as, as, the input, as on the input doll. Of course, this should be bi bi-directional. Right? So, so the, system is envisaged, it's, it's bi-directional, not, not just one way. Okay, 
And so this, this is the base, this is a system which has been uh, de developed. In, um, we made a, a doll which has um, uh, sen sensors which is very responsive to uh, uh, the normal force of uh, pressure of human touch. It, it, uh, the material is quantum tunneling composite. And this system is a, the idea is that, for example, mother is working and that she, she can carry a small doll with her at work and then she could uh, she could be talking to the daughter maybe through through internet chat, video chat, and but still the child can feel the uh, uh, same same effect on her body through this uh, system. In human communication, body gestures and touch can sometimes more deeply explain the intended mind. Through hugs, we can spread our spoken language to the language of wider expression. hugs with our loved ones, expressing not only love, but also security, confidence, trust, and care. Especially in parent-child relationships, hugging is an important way to communicate and express feelings of loving and care. However, various situations in life keep us away from our loved ones. Hugging pajama bridges this physical gap between distant loved ones. In times of need and loneliness, a warm hug from a loved one far away provides us with encouragement. Hugging Pajama is a mobile hug communication system that provides a realistic hug sensation and emotional display. It consists of an input hugging device, air outfit modules embedded in the pajama, and color changing accessories. Using the input device, parents can convey emotional expressions to the child through the color changing modules. In the same way, parents can send hugs to their child through the embedded air outfit modules. modules placed in the pajama recreate the hugging feeling. These modules are individually controlled by touching each of the corresponding sensors on the infant device. In this actual scenario, mother is shown hugging the infant device, enabling mother to tuck in the child for bedtime. The soft pressure and warm feeling created by the pajama simulates a calm hug. Mother also sends the child a sweet dreams message by changing the color of the flower accessory on the pajama. Hugging between parents and child strengthens the bond between them, giving a message of warmth, happiness, and love. Hugging pajama makes this possible by building a bridge over any distance. So another uh, important part of this research is actually based on uh, looking at signs. So uh, in, you can see in this example, not only was communication from the physical touch, but also uh, by, by we, we did uh, develop the color, color changing material. So uh, the, the idea is that parents could send the message by subtly changing the color of the uh, children's uh, clothes. Um, but, I'm, uh, I'm, but I'm still um, looking at how this can really effectively make communication. This goes back to sign, uh, kind of sign, signs. So in, in, in environment, people can see sign and they can uh, get some understanding. Uh, could be emotional understanding, but it's still not established. How could we, what, for example, what color corresponds to what emotion? This is some uh, work which um, uh, still has to be um, looked at in detail. Currently, um, I'm working with uh, a, a professor in our psychology department who's also uh, happens, happens to be independently interested in artificial touch. And so, together with that professor, we're doing uh, psychological experiments to compare effect on humans between real touch and mediated touch. And we're doing four, four versions of the test. No touch, actual touch, real touch by friend, mediated touch by friend, and the fourth case is computer touch, uh, which means just random computer touching. Um, and we want to see the effect of that on, on the human. Um, and this work is based on some previous work by that professor in psychology, uh, which she showed that touch by a friend has affected lowering fear arousal of the one being touched. Uh, actually, currently, right now, uh, we're doing this test. Well, my students are doing, doing the test um, in the lab. I think the very final work I'm going to show in the last few minutes is... Uh, uh, so, this, um, this, this, these systems, um, I realised that a transfer of empathy is, is one of the essential points. Uh, how can we transfer empathy between uh, people using remote media? 
And uh, so in the system here, uh, I wanted to directly study, can we create media to directly invoke empathy in, in humans? And then I, I want to use this in, in further systems for communication. But in the first step, um, I wanted to consider uh, issues, uh, issues which is very important for, our, uh, for humanity now, which is the environment. And uh, to see, can we create um, media which could invoke empathy to issues about the environment by directly that media also being an environmental artifact, a living, living object. And this is based on some uh, previous theory um, by psychologists that living things evoke emotions and promote empathy. Um, and different emotions are evoked based on the state of, of a living being. Actually, this is kind of related to the previous work where um, it was showed that uh, virtual pets didn't provoke, uh, provoke the same response as real pets, um, even if they were very similar. Okay. So one of the examples, for example, people tend to act differently if, if for example, it's, it's birthday or anniversary, uh, if you receive a plastic flower, somehow, even though that could be almost perfect reproduction, it has a different empathetic effect. Than, than, than real flower, even though the real flower will, will die. And um, so, so the motivation is using this idea that living uh, media can promote empathy is to um, create media which will um, promote human empathy social and about social and authentic <laughs> happenings around a person's life, especially environmental issues. And um, to represent these as uh, uh, semantically, so the idea is to have a kind of impedance matching, maybe this is an engineering term, but impedance matching between the data, in this case environment, and the media itself. Um, the first work that uh, I did with my students was actually uh, quite simple, just making a display from uh, e, e. coli bacteria insert with the um, uh, glowing uh, fluorescent gene, and then uh, to change the, the uh, uh, glow rate over time. By the way, I'm not a biologist, so we had to work with some uh, biology professor and other students to actually do, do make the system. Um, so the next step after that, I thought, can we make it higher order, uh, for example, plant? I actually want to see can we do this with plants or uh, flower. And uh, then I uh, thought we could use cabbage, red cabbage, which can change the colour according to the pH level. Of course, the time rate is very slow. We're talking about millihertz, right? So hours and days before you see any noticeable effect. But that's okay for such a system because environmental parameters also do not change so fast. And to quantify this information digitally and couple it into the colour change of the cabbage. So here's the basic idea. Uh, traditional media through a, a, a computer. So here we have environmental issues and we want to uh, provoke uh, an em empathetic factor in the human. And so the uh, hypothesis is that em empathetic media will have some gain in the empathy in the human. Uh, related to traditional media. And this is the basic system here, uh, where we have some any digital data, but in this case it should be specific, specifically about the environment. We have a control system, and we have um, a cabbage in pH control solution. And it can, uh, of, of a slow time frame, change the, the colour. And here you can see uh, the scenario. I'm looking at, now we can have a kind of six pixel display of information. So, another important thing is that such living media can be easily blended into the environment and become ubiquitous. Okay, so, a lot of time is, okay. So, uh, do I have two more minutes or, okay, so I'll, I'll show the very last, uh, oh, video's gone, okay. Uh, by the way, this, this, uh, 
this if this kind of work raises an ethical issue. So I think this is not should not be done for animals, but uh, just plants. But uh, uh, we have to when we do this kind of work, we have to really consider such issues. Anyway, so here's uh, the last last video. Of the twenty first century, plants should be the organizational model for life. This can yield new models of interactive computing, which brings humans and media into a symbiotic relationship with the natural world. Living media can take the form of any organism that changes under controlled conditions. Uh, but like all the big research shows media. that we make stronger connections to living creatures than artificial imitations. If we receive a plastic flower, we don't have the same emotional connection as compared to a real flower, which makes a special impression on our senses. We recognize and build on the strengths of the sympathy response with real living media. Our living media makes empathetic connections. An impedance match is made between the important issues in the world and the color changing properties of red cabbage. So it's, 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 it's time that is video it is very phase right of change. In this case, the media is living. It can grow, decay, and change to various hues of color. We propose for this to be impedance matched with digitally measured information, including social, human, and ecological issues. The control system varies the pH level of the solution containing the cabbage at appropriate levels to change the color according to the set point provided by the computer system. The control system senses the pH value of the cabbage and then determines the difference to be corrected in order to reach that set point. It then activates the pump for either the acid or base solution to make the appropriate correction. A special flavor in the cabbage changes color depending on the pH level. An acidic solution changes the color from pink to purple, and an alkali solution will provide a change of color through pink to green. Varying hues of color along the pH range allow for rich visualization of information. Mm. We're running out of time, so okay, I have no time to show you this slide. So okay, I think I just skip this for another time. Uh, so uh, I will say thank you very much.